Welcome this broad spectrum of women here tonight that range from 13 to seniors. This is intended to be informative and engaging. We are women working together to understand God's will in our lives, individually and collectively. If you have any questions regarding anything said in these sessions, please feel free to ask your pastor about them. Since this is women speaking to women, no authority is being presumed on our part over any, anyone else. We recognize the Apostle Paul's instructions about everything should be done decently and in order. Hopefully you will leave here encouraged. Our desire is to build one another up and not to be instructive. We honor leadership in our local church and expect the saints of each local gathering to work with their leaders. We want to leave here tomorrow afternoon with our hearts and our minds having been taught by our Lord Jesus Christ. So if y'all want to take a moment to pray for everyone that's going to speak tonight. My talk is called, uh, entitled, Mean Girl Facing Your Beauty Turned Beast. So I'm going to ask all the single girls uh, 13 to 30 or whatever. If y'all would do me a favor because I'm going to have you do something. If you would move your seat and sit by someone that you've either never sat by before or that you don't usually sit by. And I want you to tell that person three things about them that you appreciate. And um, sometime during tonight and get to know that person maybe a little bit. I'll give an example. Is Sister Dorothy here, Dorothy Bryant? Oh, there she is. Okay, and see her. I don't know Sister Dorothy very well, but I know that she is faithful to the Lord and that she is a very hard worker and that when she sees something to be done, she does it without being asked. So there's just a few examples of what, what I'm talking about. I would just like to share some thoughts that um, the Lord gave me about a year ago. Um, in the Bible reading early last year, I was uh, really inspired by some scriptures on where it talks about having a willing heart. And the first one is, Exodus 35, 5. Um, Take from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring an offering to the Lord. And verse 21 says, And they came, everyone whose heart was willing, or whose heart was stirred, and everyone whose spirit was willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation for all the service, or for all of his service. And in verse 29, it says, The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made him willing to bring an offering for all manner of work. And what really stood out to me about those few scriptures was that um, we are to give of ourselves willingly. And that ties in with worship and how we serve God. And it's that we lay aside ourselves in order to give more of our time and more of ourselves to God. It's to be open and willing to do whatever it is that he calls us to do. It's not me saying, okay, God, here's my life. I'll serve you as long as you put me in this ministry. I'll only serve you if you call me to Europe, or I'll only serve you if you put me over here, or I'll only do this job. It's, it's more than, it, it's not that at all. It's when, to me, having a willing heart for God means that you spend time in trying to equip yourself with his spirit and with his word, and that you ready yourself 
to be sent wherever, even if it's just doing something here in the church. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be some foreign um, ministry. God charges you with a task and you become willing. Part of that is not just, okay, well, you've called me to do this, so that's the only thing I'm going to do. Part of being willing to me means that you're willing to do more than that. If he calls you to take one step, try and find places where you can take an extra step. You know, if, if you see someone that's in need and you, you want to help them, don't just, you know, oh, here's some money, go buy some groceries, and that's all I'll do. Look for ways where you can go beyond just that and to help people more in any ministry. And a good example of this kind of spirit that's found in Genesis 24. And we all know the story of Rebecca. And in this story, Eliezer sets out looking for a woman simply with a willing heart. He puts out a fleece to God and basically says that the woman who freely offers of herself to go beyond what she is asked, she is the one, she is the willing heart, the willing hearted woman that he is looking for. And in verse 45, Rebecca came out and proved herself to be that woman. A task was set before her and she freely offered to do more work than what was requested. And later in the chapter, she is faced with another request. Rebecca's family and Eliezer ask her if she would be willing to travel to a country that is foreign to her to marry a man who she has never met. When she is asked of this, she simply and wholeheartedly answers, I will go. And 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each one must give as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly, out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So my the burden that I've had is to serve God willingly and cheerfully, no matter what I am called to do or where I'm called to go. I want to always say, yes, I will go with a willing heart.
walk and keep praying. <laughs> we had a good prayer, but it won't hurt to pray some more. <clears throat> when Sister Becky asked me to uh, speak on prayer, um, I thought, sure, I can do that. I pray every day, you know. But then when I started thinking about it, what am I going to say? You know, prayer is such a personal thing. And, and, um, but anyway, I had read a book uh, several years ago, uh, uh, A Woman's Call to Prayer by Elizabeth George. Prayer is, is the highest activity of which the human spirit is capable. Through prayer, we worship God, we honor the character of God, we bring our needs before him. We enter fully into one of the privileges we have as his child, that of communing with the God of the universe. If all of this is true, why wouldn't I want to pray? Even though I know praying to God will definitely be rewarding and a blessing, I also know it is a serious undertaking. Approaching our God while both a joy and a privilege is an awesome consideration. Then there is a challenge of finding and making time to focus on communing with God. There is no right or wrong way to pray except not to pray. And there is no particular position for our bodies to be in as long as our heart is bowed to God. And I must tell you that I got this yesterday morning at 2.30 in the morning this last little thought, it has been such an inspiration to me. And, and it's like, I can almost feel my heart. Do you ever feel your, something in your chest and in your midriff here flip over sometimes whenever you're praying to the Lord or when you feel his wonderful spirit and are blessed by him? Anyway, I just I wanted to share that. It was such a, such a thought to me and such a blessing. And then uh, she had uh, listed several reasons that women don't pray. And the first one was worldliness. And she said, there are no voices in the world admonishing us to be spiritually minded and prayer is a spiritual exercise. First John 2.16 says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. As the songwriter expressed, when you turn your eyes upon Jesus, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And then there's the busyness. It, all Christian women are busy, and they should be. The Bible clearly instructs that a strong work ethic is godly and wise of a woman of strong character. A woman who is too busy to pray is simply too busy. I'm not a multitasker, but I used to be when I was younger. And <clears throat> I could do several different things, you know, and have a lot of things on my mind. But since I'm older, I don't, I'm not able to do that. But prayer is still something that I can do while doing other things, uh, while driving to the store, or we can do it while we're working, or driving to work or to school, while doing our housework, your homework. You can pray that you get a good grade. <laughs> and then there's foolishness. Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Focus our life on the greater rather than the lesser on the eternal rather than the earthly, and that is done through prayer. And then there's distance that keeps us from praying. If you know people well, you can usually talk with them, but we might have difficulty talking to a stranger. The same thing happens in our communication with God. Start talking to God through prayer. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Think about a friendship you once enjoyed that isn't as close as it used to be. What happened? The same can be true with our relationship with God. We must keep making the effort to pray. And then there's ignorance. I don't like that word, but it's pretty much, it's, but it is just not, it's just not understanding God's goodness or his desire 
and his ability to provide for us might cause us not to ask or pray. God will give us the desires of our heart. Matthew 7, 9 through 11 says, Jesus taught if a son asked his father for bread, would he give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would he give him a serpent? If we being human know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more our heavenly father will give good things to those who ask. And in Matthew 6, 11, ask for your daily needs. Cultivate the childlike faith of the little boy who announced to his family, I'm going to say my prayers. Anybody need anything? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to have that childlike faith? <laughs> and then there's sinfulness. Genesis 3, 8, Adam and Eve hid themselves from God after they had sinned. Matthew 6, 12 says, Jesus instructs us to pray asking him to forgive our debts, our trespasses and offenses, the wrong that we have done. And then after we confess, the communion of God is opened up again. So as women who are called to God's kingdom must not deny our sin, nor blame others, or hide it, or rationalize it. David said to God, after you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. So we need to keep short the accounts with God when it comes to sin. In other words, deal with any sin quickly. So the effectual prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much, James says. And then there's faithlessness. When we don't think prayer makes any difference, we don't think, think things might have different outcomes due to prayer, so we don't pray. But Matthew 21, 22 says, What's Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. What was said of the Israelites, they could not enter in because of unbelief. The same can be said of our prayer. If we don't believe, they won't get into heaven. Then there's pridefulness. Prayer reflects our dependence on God. When we fail to pray, we are saying we don't have any needs. The self-sufficient do not pray. The self-satisfied will not pray, and the self-righteous cannot pray. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. And then there's inexperience. Prayer, like anything else, becomes easier with repetition. The more we pray, the more we know how to pray, and the more we know how to pray, the more we pray. So even Jesus' disciples had difficulty praying. Luke 11, 1 says, Lord, teach us to pray. We can say the same thing. We can ask the Lord to teach us to pray. Then there's many, many reasons we need to pray. When we're in trouble, we need to pray. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. And supplication just means to ask earnestly and humbly with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God. Esther 4, 8, Esther went into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. Jesus points us to prayer in times of trouble. Luke 18, 1, the men ought always to pray and faint not. As Christians, we are called for, uh, uh, to pray for others, including those who have failed us or harmed us, Moses prayed for his brother Aaron after he had disappointed both Moses and God. When we are disappointed by others or inaccurately accused of wrongdoing, and if we fail to forgive, we become unable to pray effectively. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. We can carry a grudge, allowing bitterness or resentment to take root in our hearts. Our hearts must be right before God in order to forgive and pray for those who fail and disappoint us. Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, and I've added our woman, availeth much. James 5:16. And then Jesus shows us the right way of dealing with those who disappoint us. He says we are to pray for them. Luke 6, 28, bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. A clean heart toward God and the offender prepares the way for praying from the heart in a hurtful situation. 
We are to lend a helping hand to someone in need, not lecture them and tell them what they should have done. When someone has fallen or failed, reach out to them and pray for them. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. We are to pray for others, period. Those we love, those who don't love us, those we appreciate, those who have disappointed us and failed us in their lives, or in their love. Pray for those who faithfully serve God. And, for, and I want to add this right here. Pray for our pastor and his wife. Yes. Always pray for your pastor and, your wife, and his wife. And for those who have stumbled in their walk with him, Galatians 6, 2, we are to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We are to pray when we're hurting. Sometimes just crying tears of hurt is all that one can do. And I must say, to me, that is the most cleansing and can give me a release that I can't get with words. If I have something that I'm praying about and I can't, I don't have the words to talk to God about. If I can just fall on him, bow my heart toward him and cry tears. It's like he, he sees and he hears and he knows what I have need of. And um, pray when we have a decision to make. I can say that prayer has been the best tool that Jim and I have had when it comes to making a decision of any kind. We pray and ask God to show us, and then we look for the answer. It doesn't always come the way we think it will. If a door opens, we walk through it. I need to pray some more. <laughs> if it is closed, we take that as an answer also. And sometimes we never have a yes or no. Sometimes it is in the still small voice. If we are not careful, we can miss his answer. We should give an ear to the Lord to hear what he says to us after we pray. The subject forgiveness. I thought surely there are others that she could ask that would be far more accomplished. And they were experts at this. I hadn't done a really good job. I try not to be sensitive. I really don't think I am. I laugh a lot of things off, whether you mean it or not, I don't know, I'm oblivious to it, but that's okay, I think that's the way it's supposed to be. But I've had a few major blows in my lifetime, after all, I'm 67 years old. And offenses come, whether we intend it to, hurt someone else or, or not, they just come. Then I realized that this challenge was exactly what I needed. I felt like it was something that God had sent my way. An opportunity for me to get over some things. And let's just face it, you know, sometimes we just have to knuckle down and get over it, you know. <laughs> but I hadn't done it. And it's easy to tell somebody else to do it. But when you're hurting, it, doesn't, it isn't always so easy. It has been an absolute marvelous, blessed, adventure for me and that's what I want to share with you it no longer has become the question to speak or not to speak but it has become my passion my earnest desire to share some of this experience with you that someone else who might be suffering and hurting from unforgiveness would be able to be set free as I have. And I have been set free 
if you get nothing else from this, you get my testimony that God has set me free. And it feels so good. I encourage you, even if you can't accept what I'm saying immediately, you can't get over things. It, it doesn't happen easily. It's very painful because you relive those things. Before I go any further into talking to you, I feel it imperative that I ask each and every one that I have ever offended or abused to forgive me. If I've hurt you in any way, I am so sorry. If I've neglected to show love, and I do love everyone, but if I've neglected to get it to you, I repent. If I haven't shown you kindness, if I fail to encourage you enough, you know, sometimes it's not all in what you do to someone, it's what you don't do. If I have failed to get across to you how much I value each and every one of you, how important you are to me from the very youngest to the oldest, you're a part of my life, an intricate part of my life because we all are part of the body of Christ. What is forgiveness? According to Webster, to forgive is to grant pardon for something or to someone to remit a debt and cease to resent. It's an action word, it's a verb. In order to do this, it requires action. Forgiveness, on the other hand, is a noun. And that's your willingness to forgive. That's what Webster says. Forgiving means that you're ready to forgive. It's an adjective. It's a word used to qualify, limit, or define a noun. I also found it interesting that the word just before forgive in the dictionary is forget. Immediately above it is forget. The definition for that one is fail to remember. We all know that. I believe it's very important to the Lord that we forgive. I know it is, in fact. It's mentioned so many places in the Bible. Even in the Lord's Prayer, that's one of the things that he included. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. But how can we expect God to forgive us if we're not willing to forgive those that offend us? You might say, I can't forgive that. And you could be right. You and yourself may not be able to forgive that, but the Christ in you can. I can do anything through Christ because he gives the strength. The talks that have been given on prayer and uh, what Sister Phyllis told me when we got together and we were discussing and trying to coordinate things, that she might be stepping on my subject a little bit, but I think the two go hand in hand. So I think there's going to be a lot of 
cross speaking, and things are going to be repeated today. <clears throat> By the way, when we got together <laughs> to, coordinate, to coordinate this, it was so precious. We knew that it was the will of the Lord for us to talk to each other because of the covering and the precious fellowship that we had. There's nothing like fellowship with our sisters. And if we have aught against them, there is no fellowship. I just don't even have that one written down. I just thought of it, so maybe my <laughs> mind's starting to work. <laughs> he always wants peace between us. And there cannot, there cannot be peace when we're holding a grudge. King Jesus is our captain and he fights for me. I wish that I had always left it that way, don't you? Sometimes when we fight our own battle, we really mess up. We really mess it up. And it ends up without love. And sweet communion with him. When offenses, when offenses come, and they surely will, because we're a family, it's ultimately up to each one of us whether we're gonna lay that offense aside or we're gonna hold a grudge. It's always so much easier if we forgive immediately. If we've ever experienced that bitterness in our own heart and not guarding our own heart well enough, we know how important that is. And if we love our sister and we see them suffering something, I think we should pray that God would cover their heart, that he would guard their heart, that it would not become bitter. That's my prayer. When I have something that comes against me, I pray that. Lord, please guard my heart. Don't let any root of bitterness enter in. I thought today when I was sitting here and the Spirit of the Lord did move in. It did move in. I felt little chills go all up and down my legs. I, oh, I, I appreciate that. I value that. I don't want anything to stand between me and my Lord. It affects your prayer life. You can't pray through. You know, we're all, even in the Old Testament, it said if there's an offense between you and your brother, when they would bring a, an offering to sacrifice, they couldn't even offer that unless they went and made that right. And then they could do, come and do the sacrifice. It affects your worship, and it can actually affect your health both spiritual and physical. Unforgiveness cause bitterness, unhappiness, ugly countenance. Have you ever seen someone walking down the street and you thought they just looked mad at the world? They probably were. <laughs> and you thought they must be miserably unhappy and they probably were. Bitterness will drain the very life from our souls as surely as an open wound on your body. It becomes festered with infection. If left untreated, it infects the whole body and eventually the body can even die. Likewise, Bitterness, if untreated by forgiveness, has the potential to cause death to our souls. We are all a part of a many-membered body. Before I start, there's something we want to do. First, Sister Norma, for being the first one sitting there, we give you a gift. <laughs> for being the brave one, <coughs> one of the brave ones. 
for being the first one to sit down. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and then, um, in appreciation and love, we also wanted to give Sister Becky a little a token too. She has done so much for us concerning this. She put in her time, her effort, and you know she has a busy schedule. But she, in her love and care, and like a mother, put in that time and supported us. So we wanted to say, we love you, Sister Becky, and we also gave you. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. See, I'm falling apart here. <laughs> I may just sit here on the thing. <clears throat> I started thinking about all the testimonies I've heard through all the years, and all the ones I pray I still will hear. Because when I look out among all these women, I know you have a testimony. And one day I hope to hear every one of them. <laughs> And um, there's just something wonderful that happens to your faith when you hear of an answer to prayer. It makes me think of the lines of the song, it is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. What he did for me, he will do for you. I've had answered prayers, and I know God answers prayers. When I was eight. Do we have any Southern gospel music fans here? Oh, yes. Sure. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> but I heard this song, and it was, a, it was a new song to me, and I just was wondering if anyone could tell me who sings it, because I know who sings it. And it was, um, tell the world the party's over. The celebration for the saints has just begun. Does anybody know who sings that? Okay. It's a new one. I think it's one, of their, it's one of their newest ones. I recognize the voices. That's a hint. That's it. It was the hemp pills. Did, did someone say it? Oh, well, Lori, come on up, Lori. You're eligible. <laughs> yeah, I was driving along. I thought, I recognize, that sounds... That sounds like the hemp pills. And finish, so the song finishes, oh, that's the latest, newest, or whatever, by the hemp pills. And I went, oh, I know them. <laughs> we have a gift for Lori. She won the gift. So that, was, that was my question. Yes, that is, I personally do not, own one of those Bibles, but I have heard all these testimonials that that is like a fantastic Bible, the Bible to have. It's a, apparently a wonderful women's study Bible, so I'm sure you'll enjoy it. If a teenager can answer this, we do have a prize for a teenager. So can anyone tell me, this is for the younger ones, anyone can answer it, but if a younger one gets it first, they'll get a prize. Can anyone tell me the Hebrew meaning of the name Sarah? Susan, she got it. She's quick on the draw. It was princess. So, but unfortunately you're, yeah, you're not a teenager, so. I know you were a teenager at one time, but. Well, that was all my questions, so we'll leave that to someone else to give away that prize, so. Okay, I will. Well, I have to say about the name Princess, this is, and God said unto Abraham, this is in Genesis 15, 17, as for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. So that is what that is. When one considers Sarah of old, it is difficult to think of her without including her husband, Abraham. These two biblical characters walked together in the faith of God. They were heirs together in the grace of life. Out of their relationship was born a child of promise. Not just any child, but a nation. The nation 
of Israel. Sarah was 65 years old and Abraham was 75, when together they left Ur, the home of their birth, to embark on a nomadic journey that would ultimately end in the land of Canaan. God would then promise this land to Abraham and ordain that Abraham's offspring would be numbered like the stars in the sky and the sands of the sea. Abraham waited patiently on the Lord to fulfill this promise of a son, but while Sarah had other ideas. In Genesis 16:2, Sarah says, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Sarah was a woman of great faith. Unfortunately, she was also impatient. She was bound to Abraham by a covenant of love and followed him throughout their desert wanderings. Her life was filled with the best things money could buy. Oh, well, in 1900 BC, that is, you know. She was very beautiful to look upon. Kings desired her for her beauty. To the passerby of that day, she would have appeared to have had it all. She just, she just got it all. Except there was one thing that eluded her. One very significant thing that caused her much heartache and grief. She was unable to bear children. More importantly, a son for her husband. Now this was considered an enormous reproach in Egyptian culture of that day. So a woman had little importance until she had borne a son to her husband, for it was through the son that the man lived on. After wandering around the desert for 10 years, Sarah and Abraham settled in Canaan. Sarah was dismayed that after 75 years, she was 75 years old, she still had not borne Abraham a child. Can you imagine, 75? <laughs> but she was. <laughs> so she decided to take matters into her own hands. In Genesis 16, 12, it says, Kurt threw this verse in here, and I'm not, I understand what is not really where I wanted it, but anyway. <laughs> Genesis 16, 12, it may be that, it, it may be that I may obtain children by her, which really should be a little later anyway. It was part of Middle Eastern culture in those days that a barren woman could have children that were legally considered hers through a servant. In following this ancient custom, Sarah gave her beloved handmaid Hagar to Abraham, that he might bear a son by her, thereby fulfilling God's promise. Sarah thought that surely she must have misunderstood God's promise that he would bless her and make her the mother of nations. Now Abraham, being a just man, considered Sarah a wise woman and agrees to Sarah's request to take Hagar to be his wife. Hagar soon, con soon conceives a child by Abraham, which quickly changes the relationship between these two women. Hagar soon despises Sarah, causing Sarah to become distressed. At this point, Sarah goes and she complains to Abraham, blaming the whole thing on him. Have you ever had some, have you ever had some clever plan or idea and then conveniently blame someone else when it went wrong? <laughs> yeah, I can sure think of a few things that matters I've taken in my own hands and then thought, oh yeah, it's not my fault, it's yours. <laughs> but Abraham, who considers Sarah as an equal in household matters, advises Sarah to deal with Hagar as she pleases. So Sarah does what any self-respecting wealthy woman of her day would do and throws Hagar out. <laughs> Hagar is distressed by this change of events and wanders in the desert for a time when an angel appears to her and tells Hagar to return back to Sarah and submit to her. That's in Genesis 16:7. Hagar wisely listens to the angel and returns to Sarah where she is accepted back. God promises to bless Hagar's son. Hagar bears her son, calling his name Ishmael, 
when Abraham is 86 years old. About 15 years pass, and one day, Abraham is sitting in the door of his tent. That would be like sitting on your front porch these days. When three men came by to visit. Now, Abraham, being a man of much wealth, welcomes these strangers and asks them to stay for supper. He commands his servants to prepare some meat and ask Sarah to bake bread and to organize a meal for these sojourners. Sarah, being an obedient wife, honors Abraham's request and is a gracious hostess to these weary pilgrims. She's the first woman recorded in biblical history to extend hospitality to guests. Be careful to entertain strangers, for some have thereby entertained angels unawares. That's Hebrews 13.2. It is during this encounter that one of the men reveals to Abraham the real purpose of their visit. This man prophesies to Abraham and declares that when they return back the next year, that Sarah will have born a son. Abraham is to name the boy Isaac. Sarah, who's eavesdropping on this conversation, laughs to herself, thinking, me, pregnant, and 90 years old? <laughs> what a joke. <laughs> the men perceived that Sarah had laughed and asked, why did you laugh? Is there anything too hard for God? Sarah became afraid and lied, saying, I didn't laugh. Have you ever been caught red-handed and feeling really dumb and embarrassed? You thought that you needed to, you know, like, invent some kind of cover-up story to redeem yourself? Well, that's exactly what Sarah did. Well, after 90 years of faith, grief, disappointment, and anticipation, Sarah's son of promise, Isaac, was born. Genesis 21.6. 90 years of preparation had transpired in Sarah's life before she saw God's promise fulfilled. Everything she had endured up to that moment, the very moment of Isaac's birth, had prepared her for this great blessing from God. Sarah was truly the woman God had chosen to be, the mother of nations. Are there things that you too have experienced that are preparing you for God's blessings in your life? To be obedient is to be in the will of God. I feel inspired today by the words that have been spoken. The Lord has been with us. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and break for lunch. Uh, so anybody, are, are they supposed to go through these doors, Julie? Or the, the doors on this side? Everybody get up and go back there. I think it's all set up. There's some box lunches. Thanks. <laughs> I want to say thank you to everybody um, for coming back from lunch, to, even though you knew I was the next speaker. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and I think that's something that we do a lot is express appreciation around here and how much we need one another. And so... I was wondering if anybody was just green with jealousy right now that they weren't in my position and would like to get up <laughs> and share just one, one statement of something that you are grateful for today. And it can be that you're not me. As you know, last year I lost my job. So it was the first time since 1978 when I started working full time that I didn't have a job. It was tight. And I couldn't understand why I lost my job. But I've been struggling the last few years with my parents getting older. My dad can't drive anymore because of his eyesight. So my mother was left up to driving. So anyway, um, I, she had to have surgery. So I went and I was gone three and a half months, which I never in, intended on doing. But Towards the beginning of this year, um, I had a memory come to me when I was 16. Um, I loved Bible study. I loved Bible study on Sunday mornings. 
I loved uh, types and shadows. I loved to, you know, this thing represents this thing and see how God is showing um, some, you know, really complex truth in some little picture. And um, I, lo I love that. I, I look for it in TV shows even because <laughs> I think God is everywhere. <laughs> but um, this one Sunday morning, I, re I was remembering that this January about somebody else had gotten up on a Sunday morning and was talking. It was, it was boring. I was 16 and it was boring. And it had nothing to do with my life. <laughs> and I was, I was immature. And I was sitting there thinking, you know, when is this person going to sit down? I want to hear a good Bible study. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm so spiritual, right? <laughs> and right at that moment, I looked to the side of the building. And we had in um, Chino, we had some stained glass windows along either side of the uh, platform. And they weren't very ornate and they weren't very bright. But the sun um, shone through them. And it caught my eye, and I felt like the Lord um, showing me that it wasn't the color of the stained glass that I was looking at. It was the light shining through it. And I felt very convicted about, you know, you're looking for your color. You're looking for the color you like, and you'll appreciate that. But what if the light is shining through a different color? And... That came back to me this January, and I really, you know, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll testify, Lord, I'll, you know, I'll try and work, you know, I thought, I felt a burning in my heart of, of sharing that, and this one service, I prayed, and I said, Lord, if anything is said about the light, I will get up and, and share this, and the only thing that was said about the light was Brother Steve talked about Satan being an angel of light. <laughs> well, okay, it's not supposed to go here. <laughs> So I, I, um, I just have been pondering that in my heart, and then uh, when Sister Becky announced that we were going to attempt this, she was asking us, you know, what subjects do you want to talk about, or what do you, what do you need equipped in? And one of the things that came to a friend who mentioned it to me said, how do we interact with one another respectfully? with the non-essentials. Because I think the Lord is really speaking to us about what is essential to our salvation, what redeems us, you know? What really redeems me? And then what is part of life? What is, you know, just something peripheral? Or it could be an expression of the light coming through your particular color, but it's not the light. And so how do we share that with one another without stepping on people's toes or offending? And so I asked Sister Becky that question and she, or relate it, and she called me a couple days later and said, well, I think you can talk on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so that's, that is what I want to um, just highlight on things that I feel like the Lord has... Um, taught me, not any kind of, um, I got a revelation from God, and, and I'm going to instruct you. I don't want to be instructional at all. It's very intimidating to look into your faces and think that I would, you know, have some kind of instruction, but at the same time, I crave more from the Lord. I crave more, and if I'm not willing to share what he's put in my life, he might not give me any more. And I'm greedy enough to want more. And so that's really why I'm up today. And uh, one of the things, one of the instructions, you know, just good, uh, good in, um, ideas that we were given was to look up a definition pertinent to your talk. And so I looked up the definition of essential. And it said, of the utmost importance, an ingredient that can't be removed without destroying the very nature of something's essence. Something that is a foundation 
without which an entire system would collapse. So it's something that is foundational that if we removed it, we wouldn't even be a people. We wouldn't even be children of God. We wouldn't be his, his disciples. And then, of course, a non-essential would be something that's not of prime or central importance. And the other day, um, Sister Sandy Green came over. She had a tax question, and once we got that fit, figured out, um, you can't be around Sandy without her sharing something the Lord's put in her heart. She whipped out a devotional book, and she said, look, honey, look at this. And she started reading to me um, from a book called The God of All Comfort by Hannah Whittall Smith. And it says, what we ought to mean when we talk of building upon the rock Christ Jesus is that the Lord is enough for our salvation. Just the Lord only, without any additions of our own, the Lord himself as he is in his own intrinsic character, our creator and redeemer, our all-sufficient portion. The foundation of God stands sure, and it is the only foundation that does. Therefore, we need to be shaken from off every other foundation in order that we may be forced to rest on the foundation of God alone. And that, that is what I want the foundation of my life to be. And I believe that that's the foundation that you want, too. I know none of us would be here if we didn't want God as our foundation. And this morning I was looking into it more, and I thought of the scripture. It's 2 Corinthians 1, 20 and 21, and it says... For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken to us, spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. Jesus is the yes and amen in our life. He's the foundation. And then I was also thinking, my mind when I thought of a, um, what is the essence, what is, brings vitality to the kingdom of God. I thought of um, Romans 14, 17. It says, for the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And I think... Those things, they can excite us, they can move us, but then when you wake up on Monday morning, what do you do? How do you live that? How do you live peace, righteousness, and joy in the Holy Spirit? And um, another thing that we have to recognize is the difference between a principle and a method. A principle is a basic, basic truth or general law, and it's a guide to our actions and behaviors. But then a method is a procedure or a way of doing something. We use our methods to apply our principles. And I think because methods are something we can see, something we can feel, something we can wear, something we can touch, sometimes we elevate those methods up to the same height as a principle when God intended those things just to be a method for carrying out the good principles that he put into our lives um, it's a good attribute to have it's good to be convinced of your convictions it's good to hold them and it's good to mold you but is it an appropriate response to a sister in the Lord and I was thinking, as I was preparing also, of the power of words. In James 3, 8, we've heard this so many times. It says, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith we curse men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brothers... 
These things ought not to be so. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? And I was thinking about how our words, the power of our words, the power that we have with one another, the power that we have to build up and to strengthen. Um, it's it's kind of, you know, we don't even realize we have it sometimes. And then, of course, unfortunately, we have power to degrade one another. We have power to make each other feel illegitimate. That what you're feeling right now, well, if you were just more spiritual, you know, or, well, the Lord has opened my eyes to da 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 da. You know, and it's like, oh, well, maybe God just hasn't opened my eyes. Maybe I'm just not, I'm not there yet. And I'm not being facetious. You might, you might really feel that way of, you know, I, I guess I have no vision. I have no, I have nothing to offer. And so when we see each other slipping into that, to be able to be a friend and go up alongside somebody and speak healing, it's just, I think it's in a world where we can't control very much, we can't control. That if I try to operate in a role in this world, I'm going to fail every time. But if I operate primarily as a child of God, my identity is a daughter of God and the future bride of Christ. That is my identity. That's who I am. And that's who you are. You are a child of God. And then you bring that to your task. Bring that to being a mother. Bring that to being a student. Bring that to being a wife. You're going you're gonna to have the right channel of the Lord's Spirit to equip you. And I always kind of thought it was the other way around. You know, if I could prove I was a good wife, and I, if I could prove I could take the multiple choice test, then I would be what they said I was. But it's not true. You have to be his daughter first, and that will flow through to all your other relationships. And I think that endure those things in your life that's endure. That's what I want to connect with. That's what I want to connect with in an older generation. And that's what I want to connect with the young people. There's things in our life that are going to come and go. They're, they're, they don't really endure. And I thought of that um, song that J.J. Heller is saying about only love remains. She said, the fire only leaves behind whatever is of worth. And we've been through fire this year. And I feel like the Lord is letting us know only what's valuable is going to remain, you guys. Things that don't matter are going to get burnt up. But the things that endure, the things that connect our hearts, they'll remain. And um, I had asked uh, Julie to sing a song for me, um, and I'll read the words to it. It's called, uh, May the Words of My Mouth. And it says, May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart bless your name, and the deeds of the day and the truth in my ways. And that line always catches me because... It, I think, oh God, is there any truth in my ways? Can anybody see your truth, Lord, in how I interact with them and how I treat them? But may the truth in my ways speak of you, for this is what I'm glad to do, to live a life of love that pleases you. And I'll give my all to you and surrender everything I have to follow you. And I think the Lord's asking us to look at things to surrender, things that we have to surrender that we maybe thought was our foundation. That's not anything that took his place in my heart. I don't want it there. I want to surrender those things. And finally, um, all of this could have been summed up by one statement from Sister Martha. <laughs> Um, when we were up there that night and I first posed the question to Sister Becky about, you know, how do we show respect? 
Sister Martha said, very matter of fact, <laughs> she said, always remember that the person you are speaking to is more important than the idea you're trying to promote. of my heart bless your name bless your name Jesus and the deeds of the day and the truth in my ways speak of you speak of you Jesus for this is what I'm glad to do. It's time to live a life of love that pleases you. And now I give my all to you. Surrender everything I have and follow you. I'll follow you. Lord, change my heart. Will you be my guide? Be my hope and the light. No. I exaggerated and told myself lies. I told myself that I needed to be excellent. That is to excel at everything. I needed to have a spotless home and to be a gourmet cook for every meal. I told myself to be completely submissive. I needed to stand with Rob's slippers and provide a cup of tea every time he walked through the door. I soon found out that I couldn't possibly excel at all of these things at the same time. I could not be a gourmet cook for every meal or have a spotless home every day. I soon became paralyzed because I could not be what I had told myself I needed to be. I exaggerated what I thought God wanted me to be. Sarah told me I had to tell a story about Jim Brinkley. <laughs> it illustrates how I attempted to be a, excellent at one thing and failed to be good at anything. When Bonnie and Andrew were little, we had our house on the market. It was terrible. Carol and Amy will tell you. They know how it was to have the realtors call and tell me they were going to show my house. One time, Amy was there 
and we were putting dirty dishes in the clothes dryer because we didn't have time to wash them. <laughs> Rob and I finally decided that we just needed to stay in that home a little longer. I called and took my house off the market. I called. I told them. I just knew that nobody would ever come to see my house again. And I knew no one would be coming this one particular day. I was in the habit of cleaning so spotlessly that it would take me hours to clean one thing. When I cleaned my kitchen, I took my faucet apart. <laughs> really. <laughs> and cleaned all around the base because I couldn't stand all that gunk, you know, that gets down there in the little cracks. And I also cleaned the floor with a toothbrush on my hands and knees because if I used a mop, it would leave stuff in the corners and you know, when you mop and then there's that line and it's yucky. And so <laughs> it was just pushing all the dirt around. I cleaned and dried each square at a time on my hands and knees. So I was doing this one morning and Bonnie and Andrew were eating in the nook and the nook was attached to the kitchen. You know, it had the same floor. It was all one big room. And I had cleaned the kitchen really good, but I hadn't gotten to the eating area yet. The kids had a mess all over the table with cereal and toys and whatever else. My flat, white floor was not white on that half of the floor, but the kitchen half, it was bleached and sparkling. You could have eaten off of it. There was literally a line on the vinyl floor. One side clean, the other filthy. It was perfect, a perfect before and after picture. I, for some reason, I don't remember why left the house that day when i got home jim brinkley's card was laying on the table next to the half filled cereal bowl with dried fruit loops stuck to the table <laughs> he and whoever he brought to my house that day must have thought i was a psycho <laughs> because it was insane it was like really i had one spotless room next to filth <laughs> and I did all my housework like that. Our clothes had to all be spot cleaned. All my t-shirt material stuff could not go in the dryer. It, every single outfit I would pull it out and I would put the spot cleaner on it and I would put it in the washer and then t-shirt material can't go in the dryer because it'll change its shape and it'll get those little balls on it. And so you had to hang it all up to dry and then, well, because then it's wrinkled, you have to iron every single piece. <laughs> and that's just the way I did things. <laughs> so needless to say, I spent a lot of time cleaning and doing things perfectly, but you could hardly walk through the rest of my house because something was being done great. <laughs> I also thought the great wife should be the Proverbs 31 woman. So I exaggerated that too. Let's look at what I exaggerated. Okay, she seeks wool and flax and works willing with, with her hands. Okay, it says I need to raise sheep and grow flax and spin my own thread and make my own clothes. I lived in an apartment when Rob and I got married. How was I supposed to do that? I missed the core meaning. She works willingly. Okay, she's like the merchant ships. She brings food from afar. Okay, it says I need to travel to Italy because Rob's favorite food is spaghetti. I had no money to travel and didn't have a passport. How was I supposed to do that? I missed the core meaning. She serves in international foods? Or was I supposed to be industrious? She rises also while it is yet night and gives meat to her household and a portion to her maids. Okay, it says I need to set my alarm every night at two and go kill chickens and slaughter cows and feed my family and my maids. I don't have maids. I don't have a farm or chickens or cows. I miss the core meaning. I need to feed my family. Okay, she considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. Okay, says I need to buy land and plant a whole vineyard by myself. And how often am I supposed to do that? Weekly, monthly, yearly? Especially while I'm living in an apartment and raising sheep and growing flax, and traveling to Europe, and raising chickens and cattle, and slaughtering them, and getting up at 2 a.m. Oh, I get it. I need maids. <laughs> I miss the core meaning. I need to understand the basics of business and be willing to work if the need arises. 
I think you get the point on how I exaggerated the biblical expectations of a wife. So I concluded that I could not find or be a virtuous woman, or to put it like Elizabeth when she told Darcy, I am no longer surprised at your knowing only six accomplished women. I rather wonder at you knowing any. <laughs> then I had to ask, are we no longer producing virtuous women because we no longer fit in the circumstances or culture of Proverbs 31? Or can I be a virtuous woman if I find the core meaning of what was said? There are clear things in scriptures that I can do to be a virtuous woman, to find my core, that is, to represent the female image of God to the world and to be my husband's best friend. That is what I needed to focus on. So the two great commandments customized for me as a wife would be love the Lord with all my heart and love my husband as myself. Loving God should come first, but how do I love my husband as myself? Proverbs 31:11 says, the heart of her husband safely trusts her. She does him good. There's that word again. All the days of her life. How do I do good? If I said I just want you to be good to me, what would I mean? Is it a to-do list or is it to know your husband, to know him, learning how to be his friend? Does my husband trust me? Can he rely on me? Am I good to him or just good for him? This is one of my favorite stories of a wife doing good to her husband. Sally's husband came home and told her that he had decided to start a new business and explained all the details to her. Sally, because she was a wise, wise businesswoman, like the Proverbs 31 woman, could clearly see that this business was not a good idea, and she told him so. Jack told Sally that he thought she just couldn't see the good and went ahead with the business. A few years later, Jack finally realized that Sally had been right and had to go home and tell her that they were going to lose everything. To break it to her slowly, he called her and told her he had bad news and needed to come home to talk to her. Sally, because she was a wise woman and knew what he was going to say, she could now have her day of victory. But because she knew the heart of her husband should safely trust her, she began to pray. The Lord spoke to her and she began to write. She had a whole spreadsheet prepared for him when he came home. When he did arrive, he started to tell her what they were going to lose, but she stopped him and handed him the piece of paper. On the paper, she had calculated how much money he had saved them through the years by not smoking or drinking or gambling or many things. She thanked him for the thousands of dollars he had saved them instead of the victory of being right. She had the victory of winning her husband's heart. That day, her husband rose up and called her blessed. So stories like this make me ask, if God was picking a good helper for my husband, would he pick me? Would he look at the way I treat my husband and say it is good? Ephesians 5.33 says, Let the wife see that she respects her husband. Emerson says in his book, Love and Respect, that a man needs respect like a woman needs love. And when we understand that, we will win the hearts of our husbands all over again. Men interpret respect as love. He suggests that you make a list of the things you respect about your husband and tell your husband how much you respect him. He says men will naturally give the love we need when we give them the respect they need. He also says the results will amaze you. He says it would be just like your husband giving you a list of all the reasons he loves you. The golden rule also replies, applies to respect. Do I talk about my husband's faults to others? Do I build him up or do I tear him down? Proverbs 14 says that every wise woman builds and a foolish woman tears down. 
How would I feel if Rob was telling the guys at work or his friends at church all my faults and exposing all my failings to others? I know that if he was doing that, I would have a hard time trusting him and frankly loving him. So I try to keep the golden rule in my mind when I think about something to say to my girlfriends. I need to respect him even when he might not deserve respect. I know I need to be loved when I'm not lovely. What about Matthew 5, 6, and 7? Concerning our husbands. I loved what Gary Thomas said in the marriage seminar about when you marry another child of God, that makes God your father-in-law. How often do I treat my Christian brothers and sisters better than my husband? Am I meek when dealing with my husband? Am I merciful? Am I pure in heart? After all, the heart is deceitful. Who can know it? Am I a peacemaker? Do I rejoice if my husband says all manner of evil against me falsely, falsely, thinking great is my reward in heaven? Do I let my light shine before my husband that he may see my good works and glorify my father? Am I ever angry with my husband? Do I ever say, Raka, are you full? Do I bring, ever bring a gift to the Lord and then remember my husband has ought against me? Do I settle arguments with my husband quickly? Do I walk two miles with my husband if he asks me to walk one? <laughs> Do I judge not so God won't judge me? Do I forgive my husband so God can forgive me? Sometimes we might feel that our husband is our enemy. Jesus says to love your enemies and bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you and pray for them. And I think we even need to feed them when they behave like our enemies. Romans 12:20 says, therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him a drink. So I need to make dinner even when I'm mad at him and allow God to do his work. <laughs> then there is always the submission word. Okay, I need to be a mealy-mouthed mouse and never have an opinion or say anything, but yes, Lord, to my husband, I can't have a career, I'm not equal to men, I can't make business decisions, you know. I don't need to know how to survive if something happens to him. I really am just a ball and chain to him. Is that why it's not good for him to be alone? The Bible says that doesn't it. Doesn't it say that, that I have to be all that? But the Proverbs 31 woman doesn't look like that, does she? A woman who is a help suitable or her husband's best friend doesn't look like that. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husband as unto the Lord. Okay, let's look at that scripture. First, my favorite part is to your own husbands. Oh, I thank God daily that I only have to listen to my husband. And you guys don't have to listen to my husband. I don't have to listen to yours. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? I don't have to do what your husband says, and you don't have to do what mine says. But then it goes back to what I was saying in Genesis. Because I was created for God, I can do all things and do all things unto him. I will submit to my husband as God asked me to submit. When we respect, when we obey, when we forgive, when we submit, it's all unto the Lord. Wow. I love what I read in a book about submission that mankind was created to submit, not just wives, all of mankind. My husband submits, Christ submits, and I also am to submit. Ephesians 5.21 says, submitting yourselves one to another, we submit to each other. We live lives of submission. We submit to the government, the police, employers, parents, teachers, principals, other vehicles, the lines on the road, other people on the road, homeowners associations, gravity. I could go on, but the person that does not submit in their life lives a very miserable life. What if I decided I was not going to submit to anyone or anything anymore? I would start with gravity. You know, I would really like to fly. Submission as a word has gotten a really bad rap. Except for gravity, I think all other submission is voluntary. When I got married, I chose to submit, to serve my husband. Submission is a wonderful God-created thing. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. 
1 Peter 2.13 says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, and for the praise of them that do well, for it is the will of God. 1 Peter 2.18 says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only those who are good and gentle, but also those who are unreasonable. Wait a minute. Did that just say I had to submit to someone who is unreasonable? Okay, so early on I wanted to know, if I submit to Rob and he makes the wrong decision, what do I do? What if I think he's dead wrong? I love the one story of Abraham and Sarah when she submits to his bad idea. I think I would have had a hard time submitting to Rob if he wanted to tell some king that I was his sister to save his neck. But Sarah did what Abraham said, and she did it unto the Lord. Not her Lord with a little L, but the Lord God, her father, was, and the Lord God, her father, is the one who rescued her out of her husband's bad idea. I just love that. So if I submit to the government, or my parents, or my teacher, or my husband, and they make a mistake, and I'm doing it unto the Lord, then he's the one that's going to take care of me. Early on, Rob and I discussed my role and how we would make decisions and what to do if I didn't agree. We decided that Jesus did appeal. He made appeals to God to change, and Paul appealed to God to change, and Abraham appealed to God to change his mind. God told Abraham that he would change and told Paul and Jesus that his grace was sufficient. We felt that appealing a decision was biblical, and I have used my appeal. Rob and I sit down and discuss every decision, and a few times, not many, Rob has asked if I think God's grace is sufficient, and it's always been a blessing. If Rob were to make a decision that I thought was wrong, and he would not hear me, Matthew 18, 15 says that I should tell my brother his fault alone, and if he doesn't hear me, then I should take one or two other elders or brothers with me. So I believe that if God, if Rob were to make a decision that wasn't something that was biblical or it was against the law, I am not to submit to that. The Bible is so beautiful and full of examples for us. As a woman and as a wife, I am not to be trampled on or disrespected, but loved. But I must always remember what God has asked of me. Submission is just taking my role as a student, as a driver, as a citizen, as a child, as a sister, as the feminine image of God. So I am learning that being my husband's best friend and enjoying him is the best way for me to fulfill my created purpose in presenting the feminine characteristics of God. And through a healthy marriage, Rob and I can portray the male and the female of image of God to our children, our church, our community, and to the world. I have found that I can say, like God, it is good. I wanted to start out today say I'm so thankful for this fellowship that this weekend has brought us. And I've loved to see the faces of all the speakers. Usually when they stand to speak, I'm sitting behind them and I don't get to see their expressions and the way that they express themselves. And um, also you get to know them a little bit better whenever you, they speak publicly to you and I've appreciated that. And uh, Someone, uh, I think it was Phyllis said this morning about feeling something turn over in you whenever uh, you feel the Spirit of the Lord. And uh, it caused me to think whenever I think of going to the Lord in prayer or just in supplication or whatever, there's something that turns over inside me. I get so excited to think that I'm going to meet Him. You know, maybe I'm washing dishes and I think I'm going to go pray. And something inside of me just gets so thrilled. I just can't wait that I can go and have prayer with him and meet him. And it's not like I have to introduce myself to him every time. It's not like he doesn't know me. But it's like we've got this connection and it's, it's so, I'm in love with him. And I want to meet him. I want to be with him.
and other things take our attention and our time. But that opportunity of knowing he's just right there and you can go to him and that he is going to be there for you is, is beautiful and it's exciting. Every moment of the day is exciting knowing he's just right there and you can touch him and talk to him and be with him at any time. And uh, I read this on a card and it touched my heart. And it says, when God made you, he did so with a purpose and a plan. He saw all of your days before you lived, one of them, and he placed over you the covering of his protective love. He's allowed nothing to come into your life that has not first been screened through that love. He calls you by name. You are his beloved child, the apple of his eye, the delight of his heart and today you are in the exact place that he wants you to be and tomorrow he will be with you as he has always been in goodness and kindness and faithfulness greatness is determined by character it consists of honesty kindness mercy diligence and perseverance we as sisters help each other to see God's character we are sisters of truth, sisters of spirit, and we turn to each other in the times of stress. Sisters are a safety net in a chaotic world simply by being there for each other. And she is a gift of the heart. And I had to tell you that because as Janelle had expressed today, Many times you just need to hear a word or just know somebody else recognizes where you're at and what your needs are and can just say that thing or just give you a hug or send you a card and it just makes all the difference. She is your mirror sh shining back at you. Sisters, <laughs> I read this and I thought it was sweet, are all different flowers in the same garden. <laughs> And that beautiful. <laughs> so it says we feel as sisters that we can offer nothing, but God can do great things through the humble material that is surrendered to His touch. And I um, wanted to read this about the silver. I'm sure many of you have heard it. It's called the finest silver. There was a group of women in a Bible study of the book of Malachi. And as they were studying chapter 3, they came across verse 3, which says, He will set as a refiner and a purifier of silver. This verse puzzled the women, and they wondered what this statement meant about the character and nature of God. One of the women offered to find out about the process of refining silver and get back to the group at their next Bible study. That week, this woman called up a silversmith and made an appointment to watch him at work. She didn't mention anything about the reason for her interest in silver beyond her curiosity about the process of refining silver. <laughs> As she watched the silversmith, he held a piece of silver over the fire and let it heat up. He explained in refining silver, one needed to hold the silver in the middle of the fire. The flames were hottest as they burn away all of the impurities. The woman thought about God holding us in such a hot spot. And then she thought again about the verse that he sets as a refiner and a purifier of silver. She asked the silversmith if it was true that he had to sit there in front of the fire the whole time that the silver was being refined. And the man answered that yes, he not only had to sit there holding the silver, but he had to keep his eyes on it the whole entire time. The, it was in the, the whole time that it was actually in the fire. He had to watch it every moment. If the silver was left even a moment too long in the flames, it would be destroyed. The woman was silent for a moment and then she asked the silversmith, how do you know when the silver is fully refined? And he smiled at her and he answered, oh, that's easy. It's finished when I can see my image in it. God is a refiner. 
He processes us to perfection. And he will take unpure and make it pure. He will take the dull and he'll make it beautiful. And he'll take potential value and actually make it value. Malachi 3 shows that God shall set as a refiner. And this can, contains the promise of his attentive presence. Intentional workmanship upon a creation, upon his creation. He is the true refiner and we are his silver. The fire is of his making and through his fire, our refiner will complete an awesome work. The fire's power is not constrained to destruction. Its most significant use in this is the purification, achieved daring refinement. It burns for your good and his glory. How find a line between destruction and purification? The events that happen in your life, he is using to make you like Christ. He's using the flames to melt and burn away all undesirable elements, leaving you pure and radiant. 2 Corinthians 3.13, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. If today you are feeling the heat of the fire, remember that God has his eye on you, and he will keep watching you until he sees his image in you. Zechariah 13, 9, and I love this. I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined. And I will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people. <laughs> and they shall say the Lord, he is my God. <laughs> I have loved meeting with everybody. There'd be some days that we'd have to go to Becky's, and I'd think, oh, I don't have time to do this today. I don't have time to do this today. But I would get there and would always be blessed when I left. And uh, Sister Janelle was saying the other day when she thanked Sister Teresa, and Teresa said, she said, I needed that today, Janelle. I found out that each one of these women are just as human as I am. They have struggles. They have uh, <coughs> facets of their life that maybe they don't feel like are, are where they <coughs> want them to be. But they're on their journey for God. And that's what's important, is they're on their journey for God. And I'm supposed to address um, entertaining the spirit in service. And uh, you'll probably think I took a long way around to do this. But um, I have a lot of funny stories in here, if I don't make it a little bit funny. I'll stand here and cry all day. And plus, I'm kind of like Janelle. Um, I kind of see God in funny places, like <laughs> places maybe somebody else wouldn't think you would see him. But <laughs> um, I get ideas from funny stories or from commercials or <laughs> different things. But it's based on John 4, 23, 24, where it says, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit and truth. That they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. What is worship? Worship actually is done, our whole life is done with worship. It, our life is worship. But there does come a moment when we come in service to where we worship God collectively and in unity as a group. Um, is worship a noun or a verb? or maybe an adverb, is it something you do, a state of being, or a description of ourselves as we come before God in music on Sunday service. Certainly we all have our own opinions on how things should be done in worship, and we tend to think ours is the best way to worship. Such thinking isn't new. Even the days when Jesus walked, 
This question was being whispered among people who said they followed God. The definition of worship is the act of paying divine honors to the supreme being, the outward expression of an inward affection. God the Father is actively seeking individuals to worship him. Worship is not something we do for us. It is not something we do to get the juices flowing and to get the emotional level up so the service will be emotionally charged. Not something we do to show people around us how much we love God. And it's not something we do to activate our emotions so we will enjoy the service more. True worship begins inwardly and it works outwardly. True worship lets go of the tangible to embrace the intangible. And true worship lets go of life's possessions to embrace life's obsession. It is the highest and most intimate and honest act of our devotion, our honor, our reverence, our praise, and our affection to the one who is the object of our heart's deepest longing. In looking through the Bible, there are a lot of great worship leaders. And in the Old Testament, they're not just little songs, and they're not all singing and dancing numbers. Exodus 15, Moses and the people of Israel, they escape from Egypt through the Red Sea. They make it to the other side. All the chariots get swallowed up in the sea. What happens? They stop and have a good old sing-song. It's kind of a duet called the Song of Moses and Miriam. It's a huge hit. Then there's David. David must have been a nightmare to be a fugitive with. Saul's army was breathing down their necks, and they hid in a cave with David and everyone keeping very still. Suddenly, David's got out his harp. No wonder they all abandoned him. He was completely a nightmare. Then later, when he became King David, we all have the big dance routines with lots of people, whole great troops of singers and dancers, and David has loads of hits. And if you think about it, it there were a lot of them. And Solomon, he's got his own book of songs, and the sons of Korah, and the number of hits scattered throughout the Psalms and the Levites. The point is that the Old Testament is full of songs, and we know who wrote them, we know who sang them, and we know who the worship leaders were. Then at the start of the New Testament, the same thing carries on. In Luke 1 and 2, there were four individual songs. Mary's song, Zachariah's song, he was a mute, and then suddenly he began to sing praise. They sang when Jesus arrives at the temple, and the New Testament promises to be packed full of songs, and we can expect songs from Peter, Paul, James, and John, the Sons of Thunder. Sounds like a great name for a rock band. And they were a rock band. <laughs> they did everything they knew to they did everything they knew to do to worship God with singing and dancing and all the sacrifices and so on. These things were done with sincere hearts and devotion to God, but something else was needed. And what could it be? The day of Pentecost came and something changes. The Spirit of God is now living inside the heart. God has always gone right for the heart, so he went right inside. No more the blood of bulls and goats, and no more a tent or a house of stone, but we've become the house you've sought, a heart of flesh, your perfect home. We now have a new worship leader. The Holy Spirit is leading the worship. Now let's talk about our church service. Service, the occupation or function of serving. In active service. Active service. Glad to be a service. I'm glad to be a service. It means you con contribution to the welfare of others. We come to service to serve this awesome God of the universe, the one who gave his son that this might be possible. I love this Prince of Peace, my Redeemer, the lover of my soul. And through grace and mercy, we have access directly to God. <clears throat> Psalms 101, it says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. And serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. 
Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. I love the awesomeness of the praise and thankfulness each time we start the service when Brother Steve has a stand and give thanks and praise to God. This opens the door for us as an individual and as a group in a unit to go deeper in God and his purpose. God wants us to worship in the spirit, and this goes beyond the lifting of the hands and the dance and the shout. These are all emotions that we all feel as a vessel of God, but he's calling for worship beyond this. To entertain the Spirit, we need to know where the worship comes from. We are the vessel that the Holy Spirit lives in. The Spirit within the heart can go right to the throne of God. It comes directly from the heart. It is a perfect example of submission to God. We give all of our will and all of our thoughts and all of our brokenness to the Spirit to worship freely. Christ has invested everything on earth in his church. He, he feeds her, he frees her, he purifies her, and he restores her. But he never, never takes his eyes off of her. So if you're in fear that what God's doing is just maybe a little too far out for you, don't worry about it. He never takes his eyes off of her. Never. So I had a... I'm not even going to read those. We're just going to go to, I just have a little demonstration. So if you're a little nervous about getting out of the box, and um, I've seen several people get out of the box these last two days that never do. I saw Sister Julie get out of her box. So I know you can get out of your box. I know you can testify. <laughs> I know you can praise the Lord. And, uh, and it's been a blessing to get out of the box. And it gives God the chance to do what he wants to do. Where Our just... worship of God is to involve a radical transformation to his culture. Our minds must be fit, must fit the eternal patterns of heaven. Our conformity is over. Transformation must begin. Because of the lateness of the hour, I'm going to just not speak today because it's already 3.35 and um, we're, we were going to have another song. I'm just going to have April say, she's got just a very, very short thing to say here. I'm going to let April say that and we're going to have a special and dismiss. But hasn't this been good? Yes. Hasn't it been good? Every speaker has been touched by the Lord. I am so happy that the Lord moved in in such a way as this. He has really, really, really favored us today and last night. And I, I am just thrilled that all of you from every generation, and I was gonna talk about cultural changes, and I was gonna talk about generational uh, differences where we come together from the youngest to the oldest, because that's the desire of our heart is for all of us to come together I don't think there's a person in here that doesn't want a united church. If there's any one thing that we want, the older generation, and I'm going to speak for them because I'm getting old. <laughs> we want you to forgive us, you younger people, if we have devalued you in any way in not welcoming you into the adult world. You don't have to be 50 years old to be of value. You don't have to be 40 years old to be of value. You can be of value where you are, who you are. Could you not see that? We had teenagers speaking here. We didn't have anybody in their 20s, and I'm sorry for that. We tried to get somebody in every age. We had people in their 30s. We had people in their 40s, people in their 50s, people in their 60s speaking here. We were trying to appreciate and value every one of you in every age bracket. I hope you can feel our heart. We're sorry if we have hurt any of you younger people in making you feel devalued in any way. And I know the younger people have a part too. And I'm just speaking for the old people because I am old. <laughs> but I love everybody here. I love what the Lord is doing 
He's helping us every step of the way. Every step of the way. I see his hand. He's pushing on us. He's not saying, go slow. He's saying, come on. There's a greater work than what we've seen. And it's right here in front of us. And our goal, any changes that we make in this church, any changes has one purpose, to reach out and touch somebody else. If your motive for change is any other reason but that, then that's not, you haven't got the picture. It's about reaching out and touching other people just like the Lord did. Touching others. So that's what we're interested in, is touching others. And uh, April's going to come right now, and, and there's going to be a song and then close. I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, a knot. Um, Sister Donna had, like I said, given, um, given a talk to some of the young girls about uh, the power of a knot. And I'm just going to go over it very quickly because um, I have other things to say. Um, it impacted me because it was, it was something, um, you know, a rope. I feel like a rope, God is holding out a rope for us. He's our anchor. And that rope consists of all of us, of you and me. We are anchored in Jesus, and when one of us has a need, we tie a knot for any of us to hold on to so that we don't lose anybody. And that is, in essence, what I'm going to talk about. Um, I've been given many knots by testimonies, by friends saying a few things, just by a smile at times. Um, I need all of you. You are my lifeline. If I didn't have all of you, I would die. Um, I was, uh, the Lord helped me because I, I was looking up, I was, I was trying to think of what all I could say that would help me to help you understand what I was feeling. And I just got a thought, and I thought, well, what type of rope is the strongest type of rope? So I went online, and I started looking, and it is a, a nylon braided rope is actually the strongest rope there is. There is no rope any stronger. Uh, nylon begins as a vicious, is that how it's? Viscous. viscous, thank you. Viscous liquid, and it is heated and forced with pressure through a mold to create strands needed for this rope. So it's created through pressure and heat. And um, fish, I found it interesting all the little facts about um, uh, these nylon ropes. Fishermen use these type of ropes. Um, and I also found it interesting, I was looking at knots. And the fisherman knot is, is not hard, but I, I, it, it, it's to hook two pieces of rope together and it makes it stronger. I'm gonna tie one here for you very quickly. And it is very strong, these fisherman ropes, I mean, this fisherman knot. You wrap, you wrap, you take the two pieces and you tie a knot on one end in the middle of the first rope. You take that first rope and hook it to the second rope. And um, you may not get what I got out of it, but, when you pull it together, these two ropes, you can't pull them apart. It is strong. And when God puts us together, nobody can tear us apart unless we are not ourselves. Nobody can pull us apart. Um, we can pull it this way to give ourselves a little bit of room. Now watch, I won't be able to do it. We can, we can pull it this way to give, our, give ourselves some room, but when there is pressure applied to our life, we need to come together and be, and, and be unified. Um, they use, the fishermen use these types of rope, this nylon rope. Um, nylon ropes absorb water and can be stored wet. And I liken that to the Spirit of the Lord. Um, we can absorb a lot of water. And when we're stored wet, um, it, it's a good thing. Um, they don't... These ropes, even when they're wet, they don't mold or rot. Um, it also conducts electricity. And um, it, 
cannot be damaged by oil or chemicals. This type of rope absorbs greater shock load than any other material. It is very flexible. This rope, I can't pull it apart myself, but if you were to pull it like by a heavy load, you should not stand in a direct line from it because if it's pulled apart very far, it could actually kill somebody with the, the return from, from the stretch, from the amount of stretch it has. Um, it also has high abrasion resistance. If, if this, you know, pulling it on this way, you're, you're being pulled and, and prodded on rock or something that's sharp, it doesn't just fall apart or break. You, I mean, for me to cut these ropes, I had to exert a lot of pressure. I couldn't just get something that just cut it. It was a lot of pressure. Um, it is, this type of rope is ideal for anchor lines and safety lines. It has a memory. After being stretched, it can return to its original length. Nylon is also dynamic and is, in, is used in rescue work. It is dynamic because the stretch in the rope lessens the impact on the person holding on to it. So like say you're, you're falling off a cliff and you're holding on to the rope, it doesn't, it's because it stretches, you, you, won't, you won't be hurt. You won't be hurt by it. Um, a double braided nylon rope is used for lifeline systems, slings, and personal safety lines. Diamond braided nylon ropes are used for barrier netting and fall protection systems. The solid braid rope, which is what this is, is tightly woven with a special lock stick, lock stitch construction. Uh, this rope uses many strands, but it just depends on the size. Uh, I, I'm not sure how many strands. There might even be, I mean, if, if you look at some of the ends of your ropes, there's just many, many strands, and they're all lock stitched together. You'd have to unravel them, which would take a really long time. Um, Jesus is our strength and strong tower and anchor. He is our help in time of trouble. Um, I like bragging on my God a little bit. Uh, in Psalms 18, 1 through 3, um, this, is, this is a scripture I, I was looking at last night, and I felt um, I needed to read it. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised so I shall be saved from mine enemies. Through the Spirit, we are being unified to be able to accomplish what God has in store for us. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow.
just around here it's because we're a family and these folks are so near when one has a heartache we all shed a tear and rejoice in each victory in this family so near I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God I've been washed in the fountain cleansed by his blood John Join us with Jesus as we try.